I have a habit of muting myself without even realizing it's just a habit. <laughs> In our second message tonight, um, I really want us to actually open up our Bibles a bit more tonight. I think it's important for you to read. So we're going to do that, um, but I want to lay a foundation um, before we do that, okay? I want to lay a foundation before we do that. It was very important that we understand the, the topic of when probation closes from the Bible. It's very important that we understand that there is a heavenly sanctuary, that there is Jesus who is there and he's performing a ministry in that heavenly sanctuary. Um, and so I want to go a little bit deeper now into that and, and talk about um, his ministry and the final aspect of his ministry and how things will come to an end. And the Bible helps us to understand that. Um, let, us, uh, let us pray as, before we do. And I'll just remind you, just switch your phones off as well if you, if you haven't done so already. Our oh, Heavenly Father, thank you once again, Lord, as we open your word. We pray you give us understanding now, Lord, of, again, the things that pertain to life and godliness, the things that pertain to our eternal welfare. Speak to us, Lord, give us clarity of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. When probation closes, <clears throat> anyone here ever appeared in court? A few of you? <laughs> uh, did you ever feel like this man when you appeared? What happens if you're a repeat offender? There's a saying, if you're a repeat offender in court, the judge just does what? He throws the book at you, isn't it? He <laughs> goes, that's it. That's it. Um, the Bible speaks of a coming judgment. It's probably one of those things that's probably least preached about today because no one wants to hear about judgment. Judgment uh, tends to be uh, something that's usually... Um, contrived of in a negative sense, right? Judgment, and you th think about it, oh, judgment, that's not good. And when there's judgment, you automatically feel what? You feel condemned, isn't it? You feel condemned. And so some people really struggle with the light of the judgment, um, the knowledge of the judgment. Um, but I want to share something with you in regard to this, because it does speak of the coming judgment, and it's also foreshadowed in the sanctuary. And that's why we've been studying the sanctuary tonight. Uh, it's known to the Jewish people in ancient times, or it was known to them in ancient times, and still today, but as the Day of Atonement, as the Day of Atonement or cleansing of the sanctuary, or the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so I want to direct you to the book of Leviticus where this is talked about. In Leviticus 16, verse 29 to 30, and then also verse 33, it says, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, God is ordaining this now, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. You shall afflict your souls. Very important. And do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or stranger that sojourneth among you. This day, this tenth, this tenth day of the month, this was a, a, what we call a ceremonial Sabbath. Okay, It was a day of rest. They were not supposed to work. This is different from the Ten Commandments. This is different from the Fourth Commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That Sabbath came around every week. right? The Ten Commandments Sabbath comes around every week, every Sabbath. Uh, and that's when we, we experience God's rest day. But there were also ceremonial Sabbaths in the Bible, and the Day of Atonement was one of these Sabbaths. This was assigned to a calendar date. Are you with me? To a calendar date. When you have your birthday each year, is it always on the same day? No, because it goes by the date. Isn't that right? And every year that date may fall on a different day. A lot of people uh, misunderstand the idea of the ceremonial Sabbaths because in the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, uh, there's a text where Paul says, Let no man judge you in drink offerings and meat offerings and in Sabbath days. 
And so a lot of people use that text to say, well, you don't, there's no such thing as the Sabbath day anymore. God doesn't have given it, right? But they're getting confused because Paul is talking about the ceremonial Sabbaths and the offerings and ritual practices that are involved with the sanctuary. Does that make sense? So if anyone tells you, oh, no, God doesn't want, why don't you keep the Sabbath day anymore, you can say, listen, you've got the wrong understanding there in the book of Colossians. But this day was a day when they were to afflict their souls. That's the way of saying that they were to search their hearts. And they were to search their hearts and make sure that their life was right with God. That their life was right with God. Notice as it goes on, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to what? To cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. For the holy sanctuary. What's another word for sanctuary? Tabernacle or temple. Isn't that right? So notice it's not only atonement for the people, but it's also an atonement for the sanctuary itself. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. Now, why? Why does an atonement need to be made for the sanctuary and not just the people? Well, the Bible tells us that sin defiles the sanctuary of God. In other words, sin brings... Sin, uh, sin manifests itself in the temple of God, in the sanctuary of God. Remember, we also have a heavenly sanctuary, as we learned about in the previous presentation. Notice what Leviticus 20, 23 says here, when Israel worshipped the god Molech and sacrificed their children to the god Molech. God says here, And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given of his seed unto Molech to what? Defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. So the sanctuary is defiled. And this comes back to the practice of the priest. Remember, we just looked at that. The priest, when he take the blood of the sacrifice, he would go into the temple, uh, into the sanctuary, into the holy place. He would sprinkle the blood on the horns of the altar of incense. That represent that there was a record of the sins that were confessed made in the sanctuary, and, that, and the blood for those sins was accepted by God, the blood of the sacrifice. Does that make sense? So there's a record of the sin in the sanctuary. The Bible talks about the books of heaven, that God has books in heaven, and he has, uh, in, in those books he has recorded the deeds of men. Holy angels see what we do. Holy angels see what we do, brothers and sisters. And there is a record of the sins of men. Why? Because as much as God is merciful, God is also righteous and God is also just. God has to fulfill his role as judge as well. Doesn't he do that? If you don't believe that, you just have to look at the cross of Jesus. Because God's judgment fell upon Jesus. Amen? God cannot just turn the other way and turn a blind eye to sin. No, He is just. In Jeremiah chapter, 20, uh, chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, the Bible says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, but let him that glorieth glory in this, glory in this knowledge, that he understands and knoweth me that I am the Lord, that exercises loving kindness, righteousness, and judgment in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Oh, where would we be without judgment? If we didn't have a justice system, imagine what Australia would look like. So there, sin defiles the sanctuary of God. And that's why the Bible said, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. The day of atonement, the day of atonement. The work of the priest and the animal sacrifices were a daily event in the life of Israel. 
daily, evening and morning sacrifice. And every evening and morning the priests were officiating on behalf of the children of Israel. Every evening and morning they were officiating on behalf of the children of Israel that they may have forgiveness for sins. But what set the Day of Atonement apart from every other day of the year is that the high priest was not only making an atonement for the sins of the people, but also for the sanctuary. That was the difference on the Day of Atonement. And the Bible says that those that did not participate in this special work of afflicting their souls, they were cut off from the nation of Israel. To the Jews it's known as, the, as Yom Kippur. They still have it today. It was regarded as a day of judgment. The people of Israel would afflict their souls by making sure there were no specific sins that were unconfessed or unforsaken. On this day, those who refused to confess their sins were judged guilty and cut off from God's people. So can you see that that was very serious in the life of Israel? That was a very serious day in the life of Israel and the associated um, ceremonies uh, attached to the, to the sanctuary. Um, I read this one statement from uh, the Jewish person. I want to share it with you. It says, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is considered the most important holiday in the Jewish faith. Because remember, it's a, Sabbath, it's a ceremonial Sabbath rest day. According to tradition, it is on Yom Kippur that God decides what? Each person's fate. So Jews are encouraged to make amends and ask forgiveness for sins committed during the past year. See, brothers and sisters, it's not enough that Jesus just forgives us our sins. It's that if we're holding grudges against other people, or sometimes there are differences that are not being settled yet, it's up to us to go and, and make right the wrongs as much as possible. It's up to us to also go and confess our faults before our brothers and sisters. And I remember when the, I still first started walking with the Lord and God started to speak to my heart and I started to think about my past life and I thought, man, I have offended some people. I have done some wrong things by some people. And I decided, man, I've got to, you know, I think if, I, if it's possible, I'd like to apologize to them. And I remember making a few phone calls. I didn't know where a lot of these people were. I couldn't reach everyone. But I thought, this is only the right thing to do. People that I've hurt. I remember there was one guy that, that I bullied in school. Everyone bullied him. I joined and came on the back end, you know, laugh along and things like that. And, but I felt bad for it. The Holy Spirit was working in my life, showing me my past sins. I was confessing of the things that I did before the Lord. But I was thinking, man, I wish I, could, I wish I could catch up with Joe. I wish I could see Joe, this guy. And it just so happened one day, just a few weeks after I was having these thoughts and convictions and making some wrongs right, that I was walking in Manly and I ran into Joe. Just saw him coming across the street in Manly. I don't even live over that way. I live out this way. But I saw him that day and I, I thought, wow, there's Joe. And I said, Joe. And he looked up, he was crossing the road coming to me and he saw me and he said, oh, hey, Andrew. He always looked down like that. That's why people used to pick on him as well. He always looked down, he struggled to look you in, in your eyes. And I said, hey, Joe, what did, you know, I was thinking about you, Joe. He goes, oh, really? And I said, yeah, Joe, I wanted to have a talk with you, you know. I was wondering, Joe, are you busy at the moment? Are you in a rush or you got something on? Any chance I could buy you a hot drink or we could have a bite to eat? He was so surprised. He said, actually, I, you know, I don't have anything that I have to do straight away. I said, all right, do you want to come to the cafe? And so we went to the cafe and I said to Joe, Joe, I was an idiot. <laughs> I was an idiot at school, Joe. I picked on you. And I just wanted to say I'm really sorry, Joe. And I hope you'll forgive me. You never deserve that. How do you think Joe felt about that? He was so surprised to hear what I was saying. 
He was so very surprised. But he said, he said, that's okay. He goes, thank you. But don't have to worry about that now. I said, no problem. And we became Facebook friends after that. (laughs) Because this was the day when Israel had to make wrongs right. This was the day for that. Because it was a day of judgment. They understood that God was going to decide the fate of every person. Notice as it goes on. Mortality and the future are important themes of Yom Kippur. Considering your mortality and considering your future, important themes of Yom Kippur. And we pray that we are inscribed in the book of what? The book of life. So to greet a Jew on Yom Kippur, say, Gama Chavtima Tova. Don't know if I pronounced that right. But it means, may you end up with a good inscription or Gamartov, finish well, or may you finish well. Don't you think the Lord wants us to finish well? Amen? God wants us to finish this life well. And so they understood that. That this was that day, the day of atonement, the day of cleansing. Notice what Leviticus 23, verse 28 to 29 says. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Very clear, if you didn't participate. If you treated it as just another day. There was a ruling that was made within the leadership of Israel and you were cut off from the nation. Um, The Day of Atonement was like a close of probation for the children of Israel. Are you with me? It was like a closing. This was your final opportunity to ensure that your life was right with the Lord. It stood as the final day allotted to the repentance of sin. It stood as the final countdown a final time to ensure that there was no treasured sin in your life, no disregard for God's commandments, that the heart was truly surrendered to God. And to have the atoning blood of the sacrifice on this day, to bring you through this day, was indeed something to celebrate. Indeed something to celebrate. The day of judgment. So notice what had to happen on this day. We read from Leviticus 16, verse 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron. Aaron was the high priest of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of priests. Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, within the veil before the where? Before the mercy seat. What was that compartment called where the mercy seat was? Can't hear The most holy place. Remember, that's where the ark was and the commandments were. That's where the presence of God would come. And and Moses is and God's telling Moses, Tell Aaron your brother that he comes not at all times. Don't come all the time into the most holy place within the veil before the mercy seat. Why? Notice it goes on, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. You see. Nobody could go into the most holy place except one day in the year, and that was the Day of Atonement. And no priest could go in there except the high priest. And if he went in there at any other time, he would die. God is very particular. God is very precise. We read about how the priest would go in every day the incense, as we talked about, the altar of sprinkling blood there. But in the, on the uh, Day of Atonement, only the high priest was allowed to go in there. Notice how Paul picks up this theme in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 9, see, this is not just Old Testament teaching, this is New Testament teaching. Paul writes in Hebrews 9, verse 7 to 8, also verse 11 and 27, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, Not without blood, in other words, with blood, 
which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Are you with me? Okay. So in other words, Paul says the reason why the priest did this, the reason why God instructed the priest this way, was because God was going to reveal in time when access into the most holy place would come. And it wasn't going to come when the first, temp, the first temple, the earthly sanctuary was still standing. It would come when there is the heavenly sanctuary, when God pointed his people to the heavenly sanctuary. That's why in our first message we are pointed to Jesus in a heavenly sanctuary. Notice in Leviticus as we go back, it says, And he shall take two goats. This is Aaron the high priest. He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. One lot for who? For the Lord. And the other lot for the scapegoat. Have you ever been used as a scapegoat before? That's not a good thing, is it? Do you know what a scapegoat means? That's where the term comes from, scapegoat. You know, it's where you get the blame for something that someone else has done. Isn't that right? In other words, the punishment falls on you. You're made the scapegoat. That's where it comes from. So there was one goat where the punishment would fall on that goat, but the other goat was the Lord's goat. One goat belonged to the Lord. And notice in Leviticus as it goes on, it says of Aaron, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that's the Lord's goat, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, now into the most holy place, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon where? The mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins, so shall he do for the tabernacle of congregation, for the sanctuary that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And so that's what the priest did there. All that record of sin that was on the altar of incense there, all the record of the sin that was confessed throughout the year, the high priest would go into the most holy place And he would uh, make an atonement for not only the cleansing of the children of Israel, but for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Leviticus 16, 17, uh, verse 16, sorry, verse 7 to 10, we read on. Notice what would happen now. Notice what would happen with the scapegoat. The Lord's goat was sacrificed, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. But notice with the scapegoat. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented what? Dead? alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into where? Into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. Notice as it goes on. And when he has made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of congregation, in other words, when the blood of the Lord's goat was presented for an atonement and for the cleansing of the sanctuary, Um, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into where? Into the wilderness. Did you notice what happened just then? All the record of sin that was recorded in the sanctuary, right? That on the day of atonement, on the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary, all those sins were transferred onto the scapegoat and the scapegoat was led out into the wilderness. And so sin was removed from the sanctuary. And the sanctuary was cleansed. Amen? That's what's happening symbolically. What is God teaching us? Notice in Hebrews 9, it says, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things, to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, and it is appointed unto men once to die, Paul goes on to say in, in the same chapter, but after this the what? The judgment. So Christ was offered, what was once offered to bear the sins of many. See, Paul's talking about what's happening in the sanctuary now, and he talks about um, what Christ has to do, and he talks about the time of judgment. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 5, verse 22. John chapter 5, verse 22. John 5, verse 22. Notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto who? Unto the Son. Unto the Son. Now let me open it up a little bit for you. You see, when we think of the sanctuary, we had three sections to the sanctuary. We had the outer court. Then we had the holy place. And then we had the most holy place. You see, the outer court represents the world. Jesus left heaven to come to this outer world here, and he died on a cross as represented by the sacrifice in the outer court. But then, once he was here, he ascended to heaven, and he entered into a heavenly sanctuary, and there he began his role as high priest. And, he, and since he entered the sanctuary upon his ascension to heaven, he has been daily interceding on behalf of men, just like the priest used to do daily on behalf of men. His daily intercession, right? our daily intercessor on our behalf. That's how we have our sins forgiven through Christ's intercession. That's how we have the change happen in our life through Christ's intercession daily. But at some point, Christ has to move now, not from his daily intercession as that the priest did, but at some point he's got to move into the most holy place in heaven to begin the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary, or begin the work of the judgment. Does that make sense? The question is when? The question is when? Notice Revelation 14 verse 6. We've looked at this before. John's in vision, he says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment, what? Is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And we've been studying the three angels' message, and we talked about how the, the heavens and the earth and the sea, uh, and the fountains of waters, it was, represents the, is a, a quote from the Sabbath commandment, the very seal of God. Because God will judge according to His law. You can't judge if there's no law. God will judge according to His Ten Commandments. But John sees in vision that the hour of judgment is come. And then he sees, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And whoever participates with Babylon, there will be judgment. And so we found out in our previous studies that Babylon was the little horn from Daniel 7. Do you remember that? Open up your Bibles with me now. Daniel was the little horn of... Da uh, sorry, yeah. In Daniel, we find the little horn, which uh, is referred to as Babylon in the book of Revelation. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to go to Daniel 7, then Daniel 8 and 9. Daniel 7. I want you to notice now, as we open things up, Daniel 7, look at verse 8. Remember we read this, we studied this. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came, among, uh, came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Remember, he spoke blasphemy against God. Okay? And notice, um, notice what happens next. Let's read on in verse 9. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, that's God, 
our father, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Those are the holy angels. Notice the next line. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Notice, in reference to the little horn and what the little horn will do, the very next thing Daniel sees is that the judgment is set and the books were opened. Verse 11 says, And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. See, God's dealing with this apostate system of worship that Satan is working through, that Satan receives worship through, through the kingdom of Rome, pagan and papal Rome. And we've studied that. Judgment is set. Now notice again here in uh, Daniel 7, verse 25 and 26. Notice as it's repeated. Speaking of the little horn, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time, times, and the dividing of time. Look at verse 26. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it, even unto the end. Mm. You see, God knows exactly what's going on. And God will judge against sin. Now let's go to Daniel 8. Daniel 8, notice the little horn appears here again. In verse, um, in verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a what? A little horn which, came, uh, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land in every direction. And it waxed great even to the, the host of heaven. It arrayed itself against heaven itself. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground. That's a reference to Lucifer now, casting down the angels to the ground, if you recall, and stamped upon them. Let me share with you here from verse 11 and 12 on the screen. It says, Yea, this little horn, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That's Jesus, the prince of the heavenly angels, the host of angels. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his what? Sanctuary was cast down. Let me ask you, friends, we've been studying the sanctuary. What is it that we've been learning about the sanctuary? What did the sanctuary reveal? It revealed the plan of salvation. It revealed the truth about Jesus Christ, about His sacrifice, about His priesthood. Isn't that right? But the little horn comes against all of that. Remember, Rome doesn't accept the sacrifice of Jesus as being sufficient. You have to come and confess your sins and do penance. Remember that? Rome doesn't accept the high priestly ministry of Jesus because you have to come and confess to a priest. And half of the Christians in the world are Catholic brothers and sisters. Half the Christians in the world. One billion, I believe it is. If memory serves me correctly, or was it two billion? I think it's over one billion Catholics in the world. What does it mean the place of his sanctuary was cast down? It clarifies it in the next verse. Um, yea, he, um, whoop, sorry. Yea, he magnified himself into the Prince of Christ, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. Actually, go there to Daniel 8 with me. Notice here. Just go to Daniel 8, sorry. Verse 12. I meant to read this. Verse 12. It says, And an host was given him, that's the little horn, against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, breaking God's commandments. And it cast down the what? The truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. You see that? And it practiced and prospered. And here's where we get into the, uh, the end of what, uh, of what we're presenting here tonight. 
The casting down of the sanctuary is the casting down of the truth. Can you see that? And Daniel sees that in vision. And um, notice now in verse, in verse 13, a question is asked. How long will this be allowed to continue? How long will Rome be allowed to continue? Rome, who persecuted um, uh, 50 to 200 million uh, Christians during the Middle Ages, and then received the deadly wound, and then the deadly wound was healed, and then the mark of the beast is forming, and then Sunday laws are being passed. How long is this going to be allowed to continue? Notice it says there, in verse 13, then I, Daniel says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spoke, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host, that's God's people, to be trampled upon, to be trodden underfoot? How long will this, this, trans, this transgressing power be allowed to, to trample on the truth? and to trample on God's people. See, God sees exactly what's going on. And what does it say? What's the answer in verse 14? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Notice we have a time prophecy. Then shall the sanctuary, what? Be cleansed. What's another word for the cleansing of the sanctuary? Day of Atonement or the judgment? How long? How long, God, will you judge? How long will you begin your judgment? How long before you, before you move to judge against the little horn and those that array themselves with her? 2,300 days. What's that in time prophecy? 2,300 Years, isn't it? Day for year. 2,300 years. Now, with any time prophecy, we need a starting point, isn't it? We need a starting point. You already have the starting point. I already shared it with you. You just didn't know it at the time. Notice here, in verse the, at the end of the chapter, in verse 27. See, Daniel, he understood parts of this prophecy, but he didn't understand everything. Notice in verse 27, it says, And I, Daniel, fainted. And was six certain days. And afterward I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Can you see that? Daniel was made sick in his heart when he saw what was going to happen to God's people. That ought to make you sick. I told you I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. When I came to learn the Bible and someone was sharing with me the things that you're learning here and I realized that the Sabbath was, you know, Sunday wasn't even a day of worship, man, I was angry. I said, what have I been doing all this time? What has my family been doing all this time? Trampling on God's commandments. Believing that we're following Jesus. And then to find out how many people were slaughtered for the crime of heresy when all they were doing was preaching the truth, Daniel sees what's going to happen and it makes him sick. Because it's unjust, it's injustice, isn't it? It's unjust. It's unjust. And God is a just God. And God is a just God. But Daniel doesn't understand it. And that's where we get to Daniel 9. We've read this already, so go there quickly. Daniel chapter 9. And the Bible says here, in verse 21, Yea, Daniel says, While I was speaking in prayer, while he was praying, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, which vision? The vision of Daniel 8, the 2,300 day vision. Are you with me? And the little horn. You see, Daniel 9 is a continuation of Daniel 8. And in Daniel 8 here, we're reading that Gabriel, who Daniel had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation or the evening offering or sacrifice, which was part of the temple service. 
Then he says in verse 22, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am come forth to give you skill and understanding. Understanding of what? Of the vision that Daniel didn't quite understand properly. See that? And so he goes on. Um, at the beginning, verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. And notice the next words, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Did we study the 70 weeks prophecy last night? Yes, we did. Now you begin to understand why. You see, there's a 2,300-year prophecy here. And Daniel is seeing that his people are going to be persecuted. The church is going to be persecuted. And Daniel's wondering, how long is this going to continue for? But God comes with good news. God says there's going to be judgment on the little one, but there's some good news first. Let me first start with the first 70 weeks, which was, do you remember how many days are in 70 weeks? 490, we talked about 490 years. And in that prophecy, we were given the starting point, weren't we? 457 B.C. Isn't that right? So 457 B.C. marks the beginning of the time prophecy as to when God's judgment would begin or when Christ would move from the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy place to begin the work of judgment. So all you have to do, brothers and sisters, putting your thinking caps on again, is from 457 BC, all you have to do now is go past the 490 years. You have to just go now the full 2,300 years from 457 BC. And where does the prophecy end? It ends in 1844. Hmm. 1844. You notice what it says there? Jesus enters the what? The most holy place as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. You see, brothers and sisters, the whole reason God gave the sanctuary and the plan of salvation was to help you and me and his people to understand what Jesus is doing as he ministers on behalf of us. The first 490 years reveals God's mercy before judgment. When Jesus died on the cross, because there's always mercy before judgment with God. Amen? God doesn't just judge people, just write them off. No, no, no. There's always mercy with God, and it came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took that judgment upon you and me. Sorry. He took the judgment for you and me upon himself. That's what he did. He took that judgment so that we might be able to stand in the judgment hour that is come and he's been here since 1844. In other words, Jesus is performing the final ministry the final work in the plan of salvation. He's deciding every case right now. He's deciding your case right now. Is your heart with God or is it not? Have you received His atoning sacrifice? Is He leading your life as Lord? Jesus knows because He says, you shall know them by their fruits. You will know them by their lives. Or do they continue in transgression? Do they continue in rebelliousness? Do they have no regard? The judgment is taking place right now. It's not in some distant future. It's certainly not after Jesus comes because notice what Revelation 22 verse 12 says. Jesus says of his second coming, he says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Amen. Amen. And God has a people whose works are righteousness because they find in Christ a new heart. And they do the things that Christ did, the things that are pleasing in our Father's eyes. That's what Jesus came to do. Brothers and sisters, 
of this judgment work, none, none of us knows when it finishes. That's why Jesus said of his second coming, no man knows the day or the hour but my Father in heaven. No one knows when Jesus finishes this final work. We are living in the final hour of earth's history. Jesus is doing the final work and then he is coming for his people. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14 as we finish up. Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. Revelation 14. Oh, my friends, we should be looking forward to seeing Jesus come very soon because he is doing his final work, even as we're sitting here in this place. In Revelation 14, we read about the three angels' messages, and Babylon is fallen and the image and the mark. But notice in verse 12, Notice in verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Who are the saints? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen? Amen. These are God's people. They're going to be standing in the judgment hour. They're able to stand because they, have, they stand with Jesus. And the one who gave his life for them actually judges in favor of them. Because he manifests, manifests his works, his good works in their life through the operation of the Holy Spirit. And notice what John sees next. Notice what John sees next. Look at verse 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his head a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice. Out of the sanctuary in heaven, another angel came out crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, um, uh, to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Amen. And Jesus is coming to reap. That's a bit of farming language there. Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the tares. The wheat are good. The wheat are gathered by the owner, but the tares are cast into the fire. They have no value. They have no value. Brothers and sisters, the Bible shows us that we are living in the final moments of earth's history. How many people know this? How many people understand that this is the time for God's people to afflict their souls, to make sure that their hearts are, are right, that there is no sin that is unrepented of and unforsaken. May they repent of sin. May they forsake sin. May they love Jesus and keep His commandments. Amen? That's the people God is coming for. That's the people Jesus is coming for. And we're in the final moments of earth's history. That's why these three angels' messages are so important. And so it's a time for spiritual revival and reformation in the life. It is a time. There's no other time like now. Once Jesus comes, once the cases are decided, it's too late, brothers and sisters. Probation is closed. We are living in the time of probation. Mercy lingers for a little longer. But when Jesus finishes his work of judgment, he comes, his reward is with me, with him, and probation is closed. It is too late. It is too late. And that's why Jesus calls to you and me in this final hour, in this hour of judgment. It's time to come to Jesus. It's time to come to him in repentance. It's time to say, Lord, you've got to do in my life, Lord, what I cannot do of myself. Amen? It's time to, to yoke up with Jesus. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you shall find rest unto your souls. I was sharing in this lesson in church today that, you know, generally two oxen are yoked up together. The yoke of the two oxen as they carry the cart or, or, um, or as they're plowing the field. And often, often it's, the younger, it's the younger bull that is yoked up with the older bull so the younger bull can learn from the older bull what needs to be done. And Jesus says, come, be yoked up with me, learn of me. Jesus wants to be our rabbi, our teacher, and we are his disciples, amen? And we learn to walk in the path of holiness as he is leading us. But we must come to him. We must come to him. Because probation is about to close. We cannot leave for tomorrow what needs to be done today. How many of you are serious about having your life hid in Christ? How many of you are serious about walking with Jesus, of walking in the light of truth and having him lead you? There's no more time to be serious than now. Amen? God wasn't playing games when he gave his life for you and for me. He wasn't playing games. God took that seriously. And we ought to take that seriously too. But those that come to Jesus may find mercy. And as Jesus then leads us through this judgment hour, brothers and sisters, when he comes, he'll come with his reward. Amen? And we will celebrate because the atoning sacrifice of Jesus and his intercessory ministry as high priest is enough to bring us through this day of atonement, this judgment hour. And in the life of Israel, it became a big celebration at the end of that day. And it will be a big celebration for you and for me too. Amen? You want to celebrate with the Lord? Well, we need Him to bring us through this final hour of probation. And we need to warn others. We need to let people know. We need to preach. We need, this is the whole mission of the church, is to help others to come to the light of truth. That's why we run seminars like this, so people can hear the truth as it's found in Jesus, that they can come to the Lord. They can have the opportunity to choose life with Christ or not. But we pray for each person that comes here, praying that they would choose life with Jesus Christ. Amen. And the decisions you've been making as you've been coming here, Reflect that Jesus is speaking to your heart. And reflect that he's working in your life and that he's leading you. And so I want to consecrate my life to Jesus. Would you like to do the same? Would you like to do the same? Never a time to do it than now. Can I invite you to stand with me as we consecrate our lives together, as we pray together? Loving Father, thank you, Lord, for helping us to see, Father, the ministry of your Son and how vital his ministry is for us in this last hour, Lord, in this hour of judgment that has come. Father, right now, Lord, and I think of Revelation 13, verse 8, Lord, where it talks about those that have their names in the Lamb's book of life who didn't receive the mark of the beast, but have their names in the Lamb's book of life. Father, Lord, we want our names in the Lamb's book of life. We want Jesus, Father. And we want him to bring us through this judgment hour, Father. This day of atonement, Lord, that you've helped us to see through the message of the sanctuary, through the Lamb of God, and through our high priest that takes away our sin, Lord. Please continue to do that work in our life. Lord, we want to consecrate our hearts to you. We want to say, Lord, that it's yours, Lord. We are not our own, as Paul says. We are purchased with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for you have redeemed us out of the hands of the devil, Lord. 
and out of a sinful world, Father, to be called your children and to follow Jesus as his disciples. Please continue to minister and teach us and help us, Lord, to bear the fruit in our lives, the fruit of holiness, Father, that you so desire. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us again tonight and appointing to us, Jesus, our sacrifice, our high priest, and even our judge, Lord, but the one will judge according to a people who have faith in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone. We've learned lots tonight.